Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it, written in our heart and mind. Thank you, you're bringing revelation. And thank you that as we understand the truth, then we will walk according to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We began talking about God's plan and purpose and His calling upon our life from everlasting today. And now we're going to talk about what He does to bring forth what He had already set. I plan all the things that He purposed, all the things that He already set in place through His Word prior to beginning to bring things into being. And we begin in Genesis chapter 1. We see in the first three verses, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form vo and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light, as He began to speak things into being. We have to stop and look at these for a second, because there has been false teaching that has come forth regarding the things that have happened at the beginning, thinking that God created the heaven and the earth, that that was already occurring, already had done, that then the earth became without form. They think it was, people think this means become. It can only in certain situations in the Hebrew, but here they think that it became without form and void because of some cataclysmic event that happened. This is what's referred to as the gap theory. It's a lie, thinking there's a gap between here. And then that God did a recreation, a redo, and started all over again. It's all a lie. It's all false. We want to let you understand this. It's important to understand. When we see the beginning here, when it says, in the beginning, this is the word, the Hebrew preposition, meaning in, you can see below here. Before, after that, there would have to be a definite article for the the to be there. When I put the cursor over this, this is as this word, meaning beginning, there is no definite article prior to that. Therefore, it does not actually mean in the beginning. It simply means in beginning, or at first, so to speak. In beginning. And then it says here about God creating the heavens and the earth. Now, it's important that we understand that these words in the Hebrew show forth that this is a relative clause. It is not a statement of fact. Instead, it is a relative clause indicating an action that was ongoing, that was occur being occurring at this time. And when we see this, is this is the fact that this ongoing work was happening by God, and it was, as Young's brings it out, showing the ongoing action here where it says in the, and he says in the beginning or in a beginning of God's preparing or creating the heavens and the earth. It's a relative clause. All Hebrew scholars that understand this know that this is a relative clause. It's not a statement of fact. So that's why it's not the fact that it happened at this point in time. This is talking about a relative clause. And even the Tanakh even understood this. When God began to create the heaven and the earth, they translated it that way in a sense, showing that it's a relative clause, that it hadn't been done at that point in time. Then it tells us, the earth was without form, meaning it was formless. It had not been formed yet. And void, meaning it was empty. There was nothing there yet. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, the waters. So that shows you that nothing had come into being yet. The earth hadn't come yet. It was empty. Darkness was on the face of the deep. Light wasn't even around yet. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That means all there was was waters to begin with. When it says he moved, this is the word here in the peel stem meaning to hover. He's hovering over, and what is the Holy Spirit's purpose, and what is his work? His work is what he accomplishes in the earth. He's the one who performs the word. He's the one that comes to dwell in us and bring revelation. And he's the one who is now moving upon, hovering over the face of the waters to bring something into being. And when's that going to be? When God speaks. How does God bring everything into being? By the spoken word. And so here we see it. God said, let there be light, or literally light be, and light is, or light was. It came into being. He spoke this into being. This is how God brings things into being, by speaking these things. 
So it's important to understand that these three, first three verses are saying about in a beginning of God's preparing or creating the heavens and the earth, with the earth being without uh, form and being empty, and darkness upon the face of the earth, that's the Spirit of God, hovers over to bring, ready to bring this in as he's hovering over the waters, and God speaks. And so when he spoke, this is when light came into being. Light wasn't even here before. He began with light being spoken. God saw the light that was good, and he divided the light from the darkness. He called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And notice also, the evening and the morning were the first day. This is important, which you'll see at a later time. That means from God's perspective, his understanding, which is the truth, the day begins in the evening. Think of it like at 6 p.m. when it gets dark. And then, so it goes through that period of time, and then through the morning, which would be then the next day, up till the time 6 p.m. the next day. So it begins at sunset, as you would think, or 6 o'clock roughly, or the evening. So the evening and the morning were the first day. And then we see each time, it just didn't say all these things that happened, it says each time God said. What does that tell you? God said, brought something into being. God said it again, brought something else into being. God said it again, brought something else into being, as you'll see. Otherwise, he does things by saying and saying and speaking. Every time he speaks, something is going to be brought into being. God said, let there be a firmament. This is the word which means an expanse, a separation expanse in the midst of the waters. Remember, all there were were just waters, and all he's done is just brought forth light and separated it from the darkness, calling it the day and the night. He let it divide the waters from the waters. So the waters are going to be divided, and there's an expanse between it. And then we see, he said, God made the expanse, the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. See, Young brings out what this word means. So how did he divide the waters? He didn't divide them sideways. He divided them above. So remember, with the waters that were under the firmament, they're below it, and the waters were above the expanse. So we have all these waters, and now waters are above. There's an expanse in the middle, and there's waters below. That is how he began to bring things into being. He called this expanse, the area in between, where between the waters, heaven, the heavens. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Again, that, that shows when his day starts and ends. God said, here's the third thing, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. Which ones? The ones, the lower ones, that were under that expanse. They're being gathered together. The other ones are still just up there. Gather together in one place and let the dry land appear. That's the land of the earth. So, here we see now the formation of the earth, and it was so. He called the dry land earth. The gathering of the waters he called the seas. And God saw that it was good. So now we have the formation of the earth. We have the earth with the land, and we have also the seas then. He goes in verse 11. Each time he says something, this is important to know for yourself, because the way God does everything is by speaking his word. And that's how you bring things into being. You speak his word to release him to bring things into being. You pray his word to see these things come to pass. You speak the word to deal with the enemy, to extinguish the fiery darts. It's always through the word. The power of God is in the word. So he says, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, fruit, yield, fruit yielding fruit after his kind. Notice everything produces after his kind. That means apples produce apples, oranges produce oranges. Men will produce men. Uh, they didn't produce some hybrid of angels, which is all a lie, which you'll hear about later. Whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth the grass, the herb yielding seed after his kind, the tree yielding fruit, whose seeds in itself and after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Evening and morning were the third day, doing day by day. Then God says, let there be lights in this expanse of the heaven. Now that heaven that was an open place, now he's putting lights in it, divide the day from the night. There for signs and seasons, days and years to show signs, particular seasons, days, as things are revolving around. And so we see he put all these things in there for the days and also for years. 
Let them be for lights in this expanse to give light upon the earth. And it was so. He made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, that would be the sun, and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. So we have the sun, we have the moon, we have all the stars. He set them in this expanse of heaven to give light upon the earth. So their purpose is for signs and seasons and, and uh, days and also for years to determine those things, for time. To rule over the day and over the night, divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. And that was the end of the fourth day. Then he says, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature. He brings forth the fowl flying in the earth, all these ones, the fish and the ones of the birds. He brings the whales, every living creature that moves, and the waters brought forth abundantly. So now he puts it in all these waters that are on the earth, filling it up. And so then we come to verse 22. He blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And they do, because God spoke it. That's why they do. Evening and morning were the fifth day. Then we come to the sixth day here, and he says, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, creeping thing, beasts of the earth after his kind. It was so. So here we now we see all the different animals and, and the creeping things and beasts of the earth that are now on the land. He made them after his kind, the cattle after their kind. Everything's after its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth after his kind. And he saw it was good. Then we come to verse 26. God said, let us, and this tells us something, notice us. Us is a plural pronoun. What does that mean? That means we're talking about the Godhead because who does it speak about God? Elohim. This is the plural form of God. There is a singular form, Eloah, but this is Elohim denoting the plurality of the Godhead. That means he's not just one. There's a Godhead of three persons. That is the Father and the Son, which was originally the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And so he said, let us make man in our image, again, another plural pronoun, after our likeness, another plural pronoun, making it very clearly that God, that God is not one. All those that think he's one have been deceived and not believed the Word, obviously. They made their own interpretation of it, which is wrong. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over the, all the earth, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And then it says God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, male and female created them. He didn't create him some hybrid or whatever, <laughs> male and female. He didn't, you know, are you just be changing genders? No. That's all totally of the devil. It's all involved actually in Baal worship, if you understand where it all goes back to. People are being deceived into this in these, this day. He blessed them and said unto them, God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, replenish the earth. Now, this is a mistake. Replenish means fill again. That's people who tried to jump on that and say, See, it was destroyed the first time, and now this is a redo deal. <laughs> Refill it. No, it doesn't mean that. It means fill. Young's corrects it. They should never have translated it replenish, like fill it again. No, it means fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So man was given a dominion and a position of authority. Now, we also understand, as we mentioned this scripture today, that when man was being brought into well, first of all, look at Genesis 2, 7. When God was making man, we see how he did this in Genesis 2, 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. We've come from the dust of the ground our body has. And he breathed into his nostrils, nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We are spirit, soul, and body. And this breath of life is the spirit. And actually, as we pointed out this morning, over in Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 1, it says, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretched forth the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and formed the spirit of man within him. God, remember, did everything beforehand before he started to bring forth the creation. He actually formed the spirit of man within him first. It was in him. And then what happened? 
then how did he bring it into us? He did it through, as it says in chap verse chapter 2, verse 7, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's that spirit being brought into man, and man became a living soul. So God, God had already planned everything ahead, remember, and already accomplished everything. And this is how he brought man into the being pure spirit, soul, and body, and being alive as he made, uh, we came from the dust of the ground. Then we see he planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. The ground made the Lord God to grow every tree, pleasant to the sight, good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden. So that's the only tree that was in the midst of the garden. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that wasn't in the midst, but that was in the garden. And he speaks of these. And we see, of course, we come down to verse 16, and he said, The Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that was one of the trees that was pointed out there, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest of, thou shalt surely die. Now this doesn't mean talking about just a physical death. The reason is because there are two words in the Hebrew used here. Here it says, this is the first word, die. Dying, you shall die. There's two words. Dying, you shall die, as Young's brings out. Indicating there was going to be an instant death when they, if they partook of it. And then after that, you shall, you shall die at some point in time later on. What was the instant death that occurred? Spiritual death. Separation from God, no more in relationship with Him. Spiritually dead. And then what about the you shall die? Well, that's talking about what's going to be produced later on, which would be physical death. And that's what happened in Genesis chapter 5, verse 5. All the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So he didn't die physically at that point, if he would partake of that tree that was forbidden. Instead, he died spiritually immediately. Now, let's go back to, we already said, God's plan and his purpose. He set everything all set in his word for every situation prior to doing anything to bring in the creation. And when he was going to bring this forward, what was, what was his purpose? What was, what was he wanting to do? Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18 indicates. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. It is supposed to be inhabited. Of course, he made all the different, the, the animals, and he made the, the fowl, and he made the fish and all that. But who, who is to be inhabited with? It's to be inhabited with man, as he wanted to have a relationship as a family, as you will see. We see this over in Ephesians. He wanted to be inhabited. Ephesians chapter 3, in the prayer, second prayer in Ephesians, where he said, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. He wanted a family. He wanted a family so he could fellowship with them. That was his purpose for bringing forth man and creating the earth to be inhabited. Now at the same time, we must understand that he, of course, is the one who made the earth. He's the owner of it. Psalms 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world and they that dwell in. It belongs to him. It's his. He's the one who made it and brought it into, into manifestation. At the same time, remember he made the heavens and the earth. We also see in Psalms 1, 15, Verse 16, he said, The heavens, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the sons, is the word bane, meaning sons of men. That means that the Lord, the earth is his, he's the owner of it, but he's given it to the sons of men. How, in what form did he give it to them? He didn't give them the total ownership of it. Instead, he gave it to them in the form of a lease. We can see this 
when we see what it says in Luke chapter 20, in verse 9, when he began to speak to the people this parable, a certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen and went into a far country for a long time. This is speaking about what God did when he planted the vineyard, which would be all the things in the earth, <coughs> and let it out. The word let means like you're letting something out for hire. It is a lease. You look up in all lexicons, it's speaking of it as a lease. He gave it as a lease to man. Otherwise, he wasn't going to own it forever. It was going to be a lease for a period of time. Now, the other thing we know that God accomplished things in six days, he did the creation of all these things. And then the seventh day, he rested. Now, the seven days are important to understand in relation to the time of the earth and the time of things that are occurring and have, have occurred, we see over in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And by the way, you can't mistake this for thinking, well, maybe one day means several days. No, it means Mia, only one. Only one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is only one day. Well, there were six days of the creation, and then the seventh day he rested. That would show the six days, which would be as a thousand years, would be 6,000 years, and that is the period of the lease that was given unto man. And so then the last thousand years speaks of after that lease is over, then the millennial reign of Jesus Christ comes on the scene because that is the Lord's year to rule and to reign, that, that, last, that day, which is the last thousand years. So there's seven days which tip, show forth the 7,000 years of the earth's existence, with the 6,000 years belonging to, uh, in, in, of course, the lease that man would rule, and then the thousand year being the millennial reign. We can tell about that they're actual thousand years. Some people try to say, well, it's just, it's not really meaning exactly that. No, it means exactly what it says about a thousand years. Here in Revelation 12, 20, verse 2, when they took the devil, the dragon, the serpent, uh, Satan, bound him a thousand years. A thousand years means a thousand years, the whole time. He cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal upon him. He should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled. That's a specific period of time. It's not just some thing that people try to explain it away, which is what people do. Again, now he talks about how they lived and reigned. This is the ones who come through the tribulation at the end. They live and reign with Christ a thousand years, and this is the group that's in the first resurrection. The rest of the dead that are in hell, they live not again until the thousand years were finished. They're going to stay dead for the thousand years all the ones in the past that have not been walked in the way of the Lord. Blessed is holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such a second death has no power. They'll be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. A thousand years means exactly a thousand years. And this reign will be at the time of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now, in making man, remember he made him after our likeness in our image. So he's in the likeness of him, but he's not on the same order exactly as him. We see here in Psalms 8, verse 4, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him, talking about man, a little lower than the angels. Angels are created on a different order. They're not in the image of God. They were a different order, and they were servants of God. So, this would say, if it's true, man is lower than the angels, yet he was made in the image of God. That wouldn't even make sense to begin with. And is crowned him with glory and honor. Well, is the word angels right? No. Put the cursor over it. It's the word Elohim. It means God, or as brings here, Young's brings it out, the Godhead talking about the plurality, the Godhead. 
So he made him a little lower than the Godhead. Even though he's in the image, he's a little lower than them. And yet, so this is a great mistake that the King James Version, and again, anybody that thinks the King James Version is the perfect version, we could destroy that hundreds of times where there's errors throughout the King James Version, and this is just one example. <laughs> it's not the truth. Instead, it's a little lower than God. He crowned him with glory and virtue. Now, <clears throat> as God put man in the garden, we saw that in Genesis chapter 2, we looked at verse 15. He put him in the garden. Or we looked at verse 16. But verse 15 says, The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. He's in charge of it. He's going to dress it. And he's also to keep it, which means to guard it. He's supposed to keep it and guard it. So man was responsible because he had authority. Remember, he had dominion in the earth. And he was responsible to guard and to keep it, as he had authority for delegated to him through this lease that was given into the hands of man. <laughs> and then we talked about how he commanded him about he couldn't eat the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which we already went over. Now, at the same time, we must understand that angels that were created in a different order, lower than God, they're in a different order, and we see in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, it speaks about the one who is the leader of the praise and worship in heaven. There were messenger angels. Gabriel was the leader of that. There were warrior angels. Michael's the leader of that. And then there were the worshiping angels, and Lucifer was the leader of that. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? He, being an archangel, high rank, high angel, he's the one who is responsible for the weakening of the nations. As remember, he's gone forth and been deceiving the nations throughout. They've been deceived by the devil and all the evil spirits working in conjunction with them. What happened to him of why he had fallen? Remember that angels have a will, just as we, men, men, people have a will, and they can choose. Angels are not robots that automatically do things. They have to obey and do what God says to do. They have a will, and they can choose not to. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, like Him, resembling or in the likeness of Him. He wasn't satisfied to be in the order of being the high-ranking high -ranking angel. He didn't like that. Well, that meant that he was not satisfied and he wanted to really be like the Most High. And this is what caused the rebellion. When we see this, word like here, it's interesting that this is, shows something of, will give you a motive of why he's, his attitude was this way. Because this particular word, notice it's 1819. If we go back over to Genesis 1, 26, when he said he make man in our image after our likeness, this is the noun form here of 1819, if you notice below here, the same word meaning likeness, showing the fact that man was made in the likeness of God. Well, now Lucifer, he wanted to be in that same position. He was not satisfied to be in the state that he was in. In fact, when we look here over at, uh, and I go back to Isaiah 14 for a moment, When he said here, I'll be like the Most High, this is actually because of the stem. The stems are more specific about what's said. It's called the hith pale stem. And this pale stem is one which is talking about for himself. And it literally means to make oneself like, to make me like the Most High. So he wanted to be like the Most High, which is what man was. He basically was jealous of what God had made 
and he didn't like that because he was a, you know, he's one of the high-ranking ones of the angels and kind of had top fiddle, so to speak. <laughs> he wasn't, wouldn't want to stay that way. Jealousy, obviously, was involved in this. Now we see further about what happened over in Ezekiel, and it's revealing of some things. Ezekiel chapter 28. We pick up here, first of all, in verse 12. It says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. And first of all, we need to go back and see about this thing about Tyrus. There was a prince of Tyrus back in verse 2. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus. He was the ruler over Tyrus. And he said, Because thine heart's lifted up, pride, and that was said, I'm a god. A lot of these ones always thought they were a god, all these kings and leaders and rulers. It's crazy. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. He says, yeah, you're a man, though. <laughs> you're not God, though you set your heart as the heart of God. So this ruler of Tyrus, he was a man. And so now we come down to the king of Tyrus. <clears throat> and who's that? That is talking about the one who's ruling over him. And who is ruling over him? It was the devil who ended up being ruling over him. And he says, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He's speaking about what Lucifer was in the past. He was full of wisdom. Angels have great wisdom about the earth, and he was full of wisdom. He had tremendous wisdom. And perfect in beauty, he was a beautiful creature. He was a, the leader of the praise and worship. It even says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now this is talking about when the creation occurred, he apparently was brought into Eden as well as the angels were serving him. And notice what it says. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, burnel, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. He had all these precious stones on him. And also, so he was a, that's why he was a beautiful creature, see. And then it says, the workmanship of thy tabrets. Because remember, he was the leader of the praise and worship. Tabrets means timbrels or tambourine. What does that speak of? Rhythm. And of thy pipes. Pipes are talking about the instruments. And so this is speaking of rhythm and the instruments were prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. He's a created, remember, all the angels were created as well. And in, in being created, this was prepared in him because this is what he was supposed to, this is his call for him. He was to be the leader of the praise and worship. So music was in him because rhythm and instruments were in him. Of course, this is why now that he is, he's not Lucifer anymore, he's the devil. One of the big things he has used to deceive people is music. <laughs> he's distorted it. All kinds of music has been used over ages to deceive people because he now, he's, he's, the, he's the master musician, remember. He's got all music and all these things in him. We go on here and he says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. He was this high-ranking angel that covered the throne. I've set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou wast walked up and down the midst of the stones of fire. He was in the very presence of God. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. God only makes things perfect. He doesn't make anything that's halfway. Everything that God makes is perfect. He was perfect from the beginning. Till iniquity was found or was discovered in him. Iniquity is the word meaning unrighteousness. And what is unrighteousness? Sin. That means sin and unright unrighteousness was found in him. It wasn't in him until he rebelled against God. And sin, by his choice of not doing what God wanted, he sinned. And iniquity then was found in him. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. He declares he sinned. Therefore I'll cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, I'll destroy thee, O covering cherub, in the midst of the stones of fire. You're kicked out of heaven. You're kicked out of your position. You're going to be kicked out and, and from your, where you you're, because you're profane and you've sinned. Thy heart was lifted up, pride. Pride brought him down because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom. He had great wisdom, remember, by reason of thy brightness, because he was a light bringer, light. 
I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Where was he cast to? Many people think he was cast down to hell. Not so. The word ground is the word eretz, which means the earth. He was cast down to the earth, not to hell. That's important to realize. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities. He was this is why the heavens had to be cleansed, and Jesus had to go up there with his blood and cleanse the heavens because of the defilement that occurred up there. By the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic, therefore will I bring a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I'll bring thee to ashes, where? Not in hell, upon the earth, Eretz, in the sight of all them that behold thee. I mean, he's going to be brought here as, as a spectacle to everybody on earth. And all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee, be a terror, and there shall not be, never shall be any more. Showing here the fact that he got cast down to the earth. And that is important to realize. His pride, his rebellion, his wanting to be like God and not be satisfied to be in the position he was in was what, of course, called all these things. And so this rebellion wasn't just him alone because we see in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, If God spared not the angels that sinned, and this is all, a whole bunch of angels that sinned. But cast them down, and these ones got cast down to hell. And this is the place where the place of punishment down in hell. And delivered them into chains, or the chains is not think of as physical chains, they're spiritual, of darkness. Meaning, they can never come to the light. They're in the chains of darkness. They're in that position meaning there's no reconciliation, no salvation for the angels. Some people have even taught out their ultimate reconciliation. God's just going to make everybody get saved, and including the angels. It's a lie. Total false teaching. These under the chains of darkness to be reserved under judgment. Their fate is set. So that's what's going to happen to them. In Jude, we see further, this is, when it talks about how they sinned, it speaks here in verse 6. The angels which kept not their first estate, they didn't keep what they were supposed to be. They rebelled and left it. They left their own habitation. He's reserved in everlasting, eternal, no other way to get out of it, chains, or this is actually a different word, it's the word bands, or some, something holding them, chains or bands or bonds, under darkness, it means they're under darkness, they never can come to the light, until the judgment of the great day. So their fate is set. Judgment is going to come upon them. And when we talk about this, we see down here in Revelation chapter 12, we see when he speaks here about these ones, This is speaking about the, day, the devil drawing the third part of the stars of heaven, referring to the angels, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman ready to be delivered. The point that's important to see here is that when Satan rebelled, how many angels were involved? One-third of the angels rebelled against him. So one-third of the angels are now evil spirits, and two-thirds of the angels are stayed with God. They're God's angels that serve him and carry all these things out. So, that's the status at that point in time. Now we go to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, remember where was Satan cast down to? The earth. The angels were cast down to hell. But Satan was cast, Lucifer was cast down to the earth. His name was Satan. And so because he's on earth, well, that means he could function on earth. Some people thought, well, how if he was, I thought he was cast to hell. How would he ever get there to the garden? He wasn't cast to hell. He was on earth. And so he was, could get to what was on earth, which was the garden. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, because the devil came into the serpent, 
and he's speaking through him to this woman. And remember, God made the male and the female. He made Adam, and then he made Eve. And so the woman, he said to her, he, he came to the woman, Yea, if thou, God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Trying to cast doubt into her right off the bat, and also kind of locate her and find out where she's at. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Now, is that a good thing to do, to be speaking to the serpent? Who was supposed to be guarding the, uh, the, the garden? <laughs> Adam was. He should have said, get out <laughs> and tell him to leave. But he didn't. A mistake. Adam didn't take his rightful place to guard the garden as he was supposed to. Remember, dress and keep it, meaning to guard. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, which one was in the midst? Before we go further, let's go back and see which one was in the midst. Remember, it was the tree of life in the midst of the garden. So she's saying to him, we're not supposed to eat of the tree in the midst of the garden. Well, that's a tree of life. Yes, they were supposed to partake of that. God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. God said, no such thing. He didn't say anything about not touching anything. He just said you weren't supposed to eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lest you die. So she didn't have things straight. She was wrong about the tree in the midst of the garden. She was wrong about what God said, because he never said anything about not touching it. So what does that show you? She didn't have the word straight. And if you don't have the word straight in you, you can be deceived easily because the woman was deceived. Well, that tells us something. If you and I don't have the word precisely, accurately, correctly, exactly in us, you could be deceived by the devil. That's why you've got to get the word in you accurately and know exactly what it says. So you will not be deceived by the devil or anybody else who tries to come and tell you something contrary to the word. You've got to know it yourself. So, the serpent said to the woman, now seeing she didn't have things straight at all, you shall not surely die, contradicting what God says. The devil will come to contra contradict what God says. He's a liar, remember. He's a liar from the very beginning, and he brings lies. That's why you never believe what the devil tells you. Too many people say, well, the devil's telling me this and I'm tell doing all these things. You resist him. You don't listen to him. You don't believe what he says if he tries to tell you something. You get revelation from God by the Holy Spirit and from the Word of God. You don't get revelation from devils. You don't listen to them. They're all liars. You shall not surely die. And then he says, God does know in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened and you'll be as gods. Now, the word here is the word Elohim. Would they think that there were all these different gods at that point in time? No, all they knew was just God. This is why Young's translates it God, which would be more accurately what should be translated. That you shall be as God. Otherwise you're going to be like Him, knowing good and evil. Thinking that, well, you need to be like God because you're missing out on some things. <laughs> well, that worked a deceiver. Instead of listening to what God had said and getting the word straight, here she listens to the devil who's bringing, bringing lies. The woman saw, so now she's getting into the sense realm instead of obeying the word of God. Saw that the tree was good for food. This is the one he said, you're not supposed to partake of it. She didn't consider what God had said. Instead, remember, even she said, even as though she was wrong about touching, you shouldn't eat or touch it. Well, why were you even looking at this thing for a second? Saw the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes. Anytime you get into the senses and you start making judgments by your senses, what you see, or, oh, this looks nice. <laughs> and a tree to make one wise, oh, that's going to give me more wisdom. You get into the flesh, the natural realm or the soulish realm, you're in trouble. You've got to always think of things according to the word in spirit. You're to operate in spirit. And so she took of the fruit thereof and did eat in disobedience. He gave also unto her husband with her, 
Well, that shows he should have dealt with a devil coming. I mean, he was right there with her, and he did eat. What a mistake. And it wasn't just because she took it and then gave it to him and that was it. There was more to the story. Because in verse 17, when God said this to Adam after the fall, unto Adam he says, Because thou hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. She just didn't say, you know, and give it to him. She told him, you should eat this thing with her mouth. You don't listen to any voices that ever tell you something to do from anybody, it doesn't matter who it is, it's telling you to do something contrary to the Word of God. <laughs> this is a mistake. And eating the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, curse the ground for thy sake, in sorrow you'll eat of it all the days of your life. Because he listened to her, and that was a mistake. He knew what he was doing also. You have to understand, 1 Timothy 2, 14 makes it very clear. Adam was not deceived. He knew what he was doing. He disobeyed. He listened to her and chose to do. He knew what God had said, but he disobeyed and do what was right, what was wrong, what was wrong. Remember, God's given everybody a will. He didn't make us do right. He gave us commands according to law, and he told us what to do. He didn't. He disobeyed. He was not deceived. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. She was deceived. She didn't have things straight. Nonetheless, it doesn't matter whether you're deceived or not, you're still in the transgression and the sin. That's why you and I have to know the Word of God. We never can say, well, I was ignorant. I was deceived on this. I didn't know. <laughs> you should have known. Everybody is to know the Word of God. Even if you're deceived, you're still in the transgression if you do something contrary to the Word of God. Important. So, because of this, of course, Remember what happened. Adam died immediately, and the woman also died immediately spiritually. Spiritually, because that's what God said back in chapter 2, remember, there, verse 17. And the day you eat thereof, that day, not later, immediately, you're going to die. Dying, you shall die. And so, spiritual death took hold. And of course, as we mentioned, physical death occurred later. Genesis 5.5, 5, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died physically. Now, because of that, man was given authority and he was now, he was at the position of authority of the lease for the 6,000 years and have dominion over the earth. Well, First of all, what was the result of this? Because now he became spiritually dead, and she is spiritually dead as well. What's going to be the result of all that? Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. That means there was no sin in the world before that. God makes everything perfect. And there wasn't supposed to be anything evil going on. But man... God, gives, God doesn't make us robots. He's given everyone a free choice, a will that can choose. One man, sin entered in the world, and death by sin immediately. And death passed upon all men. That meant now you're spiritually dead. And remember, everything produces after its kind, which means what? Spiritually dead men and a spiritually dead woman, they're going to produce spiritually dead children. Everybody that's born from that point on is going to be spiritually dead and separated from God. Well, that all have sinned, and that's because of the fact that their, their spirit was dead, so they could not produce anybody who is spiritually alive. So spiritual death comes upon all men. So here's the state. God makes this everything perfect. He wants to have a family. He makes all these things. The tree of life is there they could have partaken of and followed the way of the Lord and done all the, had God accomplish all the things that, and have fellowship with them. But now man is spiritually dead. And remember, he had authority. So now that he submitted and obeyed Satan, what does that mean? 
Well, that meant now that that lease got transferred into the hands of Satan. And that's exactly what happens, we see, in the temptation. We can see that this is so. In Luke chapter 4, when he, the devil in one of the temptations took him up to the high mountain, showing him all the kingdoms of the world, the moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority, the word power is exousia, meaning authority, as Young's brings out, and the glory of them, he's, uh, all this authority will I give thee, and the glory of them. <clears throat> was he lying? <clears throat> no. He was actually telling the truth. For that is delivered unto me. <coughs> Why do I, <coughs> excuse me, why do I have it? It's been delivered unto me. How did it get delivered unto him? When Adam obeyed the devil and gave that authority into the hands of Satan. Satan now, it has control of the lease. He is now the ruler over the world for the 6,000-year period. And whomsoever I will, I give it. Jesus didn't dispute that whatsoever, because that was the truth. Then in the temptation, remember, now he brings the temptation, if thou therefore it will worship me, all shall be thine, trying to get him to fall down and worship him. Of course, Jesus dealt with the temptation, which was, get behind me, Satan, it's, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He didn't say one word, about what he said about how these things were delivered into his hand and he then had the authority and could give it to whoever he was. That was a true statement. So, now what does he become? Remember, God set all the ages we talked about this morning and now we see this age and it speaks of, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it calls him, remember, he's now the one who's the ruler over now over the earth. And it says, In whom the God of this age, of this one age, this is the age then of the time of Adam's rule and reign, as the age is referring to. This is the word aeon. So he becomes the God over this age of the 6,000 years that now man was supposed to be ruling, but now it's given to the hand of Satan. We further see Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Where in time past you walked according to the age, it's the word aeon, again, of this world, according to the prince, which means the archon ruler, the ruler of the authority, exousia, of the air. Meaning, not only was he operating in the earth, but he also was operating in the heavenlies now. He's the, he is the ruler of the authority of the air, talking about up in the he heavens, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So he's, he now is operating in authority. We also see another statement regarding his, the situation in John chapter 14. Verse 30, when Jesus said, Hereafter I will not talk much with you for the, ar the archon, ruler of this world. This time it's talking about the world. Cometh and has nothing in me. So he's the ruler of the age for the whole 6,000 years, the God of the age. He's also the ruler over the world at that time that God had made. It was supposed to be ruled by God. <clears throat> and we can even see further. 1 John chapter 5, and so we know why all the things, evil things have happened throughout this world all the time ever since the, that, the beginning when after the authority was given into his hands at the fall of man. 1 John 5, 19, we know that we're of God. Talk about those who are born from above because now we're firstborn children of heaven, remember. And the whole world, the whole thing lies in the wickedness. Now, when it says wickedness, this is not a noun. It is an adjective. And it's a singular. Whenever you see an adjective, it would better be translated the wicked one or the evil one. This is really talking about how the whole world is lying in the wicked one's control. Not talking about just a wickedness as far as an evil. It's the wicked one. Of course, he's the one that brings all the evil. So the whole world is now is in his control, the wicked one. And he also becomes now, because 
we see in John chapter 8 it speaks of, he now becomes the spiritual father of mankind because of the fact that man's spiritually dead. Notice what he says in John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. So man now is run by the devil. He's a murderer from the beginning, both not in the truth, no truth in him. He speaks a lie, speaks of his own. He's a liar. The devil's a liar. And so now he is the spiritual father of mankind. And so remember, as we talked about today, and we talked about extensively that God had a plan that he was going to accomplish this great plan in order to, that he set in motion, that he set already, already was established before he brought any of the creation in. If you didn't hear today's message, you ought to hear it when we went through all these things. And remember, this was hidden from the ages. We're not going to go back through all those scriptures that we brought, but we'll see that in Ephesians chapter 3, <clears throat> in verse 3, where Paul got the revelation of this plan of what God had set forth, how the a revelation he made unto me the mystery. So I wrote a four and few words. You read, you may perceive with the mind my understanding. Remember, that's what this means. This is the word no a, which means to perceive with the mind. And this is the word synesis, which means understanding, not knowledge. So it wasn't not a good translation there. May have no have my knowledge in of my understanding in the mystery of Christ. And he said, which in other ages was not made known. Nobody knew it before, because remember, it was a hidden thing. But it's now revealed unto us holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit did this. And then it says that to make all men know what's the fellowship of the mystery, which from, from the ages, literally this says, from the ages, in God, has been hidden in God. Hidden, kept secret who created all things by Jesus Christ. Remember, we talked about that extensively. So he got the revelation of all these things. <clears throat> and remember, God had already set everything that whatever happened, he had the answer for it, and his word all set everything. All the everything was already set from the very beginning, of, of everlasting, when he got uh, put everything in order according to spiritual law. So, what was God's his plan? What was he going to do about the situation? Well, remember, he already provided that Jesus would be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Remember, it was already set. If man sinned and he was in that state, what would be the remedy? The lamb would, have, would come who would accomplish the redemption to bring a reconciliation back into a relationship with the Father. So, <clears throat> we see in Genesis chapter 3, he makes a statement to the devil. He says, I will put enmity, enmity, hatred, between you and the woman, and between your seed, which is all mankind, and her seed. What's that talking about? Who has the seed? The man has the seed. So what does this mean about her seed? That means that she's going to have seed in her, and what's this mean? This is all pointing towards the virgin birth when the Holy Spirit would come and overshadow her and that word, that seed, was going to be planted in her which would then the word would become flesh. So this is all prophetic of talking about Jesus was going to come from virgin, not through man and woman producing a child, but this was going to be seed that was put in her supernatural birth, spiritual birth from the Holy Spirit, putting that seed in there. Notice, it shall bruise thy head. This one is going to crush your head, crush the Lord, your Lord, the Lordship and bruise you, this refers to. Yet thou shalt bruise his heel, which is, speaks of what? The crucifixion. So this was set, and the devil knew this. He knew what was happening. Of course, he was out to kill everybody, anybody who was following the way of the Lord or following and doing in the right path. Well, we come to chapter 4, and here's where Adam knew Eve, as you can see, bear Cain. Oh, I got a man from the Lord. Bear's brother Abel. He's a keeper of sheep. Cain's a tiller of the ground. So we got these two. God, of course, would always give commands from the very beginning. He'd tell them what they were to do. 
And we see that he obviously gave them command regarding that they were to bring the tithe of what produce or whatever they had produced unto him. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering. Well, that means whatever he decided to bring unto the Lord. That wasn't what God told. Instead, Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock. Well, the firstlings, that would be the first part of the flock, which is referring to the tithe. And the fat, or the best of it, the choicest best part, this means. The Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, because he did what God told him to do. He obeyed. But unto Cain and his offering, he had not respect. Why? Because he disobeyed and he didn't bring what he was supposed to bring, which is the birthright offering. Cain was very well wroth and his countenance fell. And this is the birthright offering because the firstlings means the birthright offering. That all points also to now you and I who are born from above, we're to bring the birthright offering, which is the tithe unto the Lord. And the reason why you know this is the tithe is because, as some people try to say it's not, they're not, they're wrong. Leviticus 27, verse 26 says, The firstlings of the beasts should be the Lord's. Well, it means it belongs to Him. Well, that would be the first, first fruit of the tenth, tenth. No man shall sanctify it, whether it be ox or sheep. It's the Lord's. It's to His. God said it from the beginning. The tithe belongs to Him. It's His. And then we see in verse 30, talking about the tithe of the land now. The tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, it's the Lord's. It's holy unto Him. And then he talks about, in verse 32, how you calculate this and figure this. Concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock, remember it was the first things, Lings of the flock, the birthright offering. Regarding the tithe of the flock, well, how do you figure that? You don't take one and cut it up in ten pieces, no. Even if whichever passes under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. So every time you have ten, you're going to take that one, and it's going to be given unto the Lord. But that's the firstling, which is the tithe of the flocks. So he obeyed, and of course then, in obeying God, He's doing the right thing, of course. Well, the, remember the devil, though, is out to kill off everybody possible who's following the way of the Lord. <clears throat> and so what happens? Cain, the Lord said to Cain, why are you wroth? What's, why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, won't you be accepted? That's right. If you don't do well, sin lies at the door. You'll be sinning. And of course, he didn't do well. He sinned. He sinned at the beginning when he didn't bring the offering that he was supposed to bring, which was the tithe of the ground. And so, talks with Abel's brother, he rises up and he kills him. Who's the murderer? The devil. The devil operated through him and then murdered. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy, remember. And he began to kill them all off. That's what he wanted to do. Anybody that would follow God and obey God would be killed off. By the way, we ought to show you something. This is also prophetic of what's gonna, what happens in the end time, and we see it happening today. The reason we say, because, notice it says, in the process of time. When I put the cursor over this, notice the word process is the word kates, which means end. And then when I put the word time, it means day, not time. Translated day, 2008 times. It means day. At the end of day, and this happens to be plural when it talks about day, the end of days. Here's the word day, plural. So it's saying in the end of days, well, what's that talking about? That's prophetic of the end of this 6,000 year, end of the church age period of time. At the end of days, <clears throat> it comes to pass, <clears throat> as Young's brings forth. So, was that the end of days? No. So what's that? That's a prophetic statement, isn't it? That the same thing is going to happen at the end of days that happened back then. Remember that the end is declared from the beginning, as it says in Isaiah 46. 
So, this is prophetic, saying at the end of the days, there's going to be the same thing. People are going to bring whatever they want to do and not bring their tithe unto the Lord. <clears throat> As that's exactly what we see in the body of Christ today. We see many people, even whole organizations of, of like churches, that say, well, we don't have to tithe today. They think we can just bring whatever we want to. They're totally deceived. It's not our subject, but they've come, they've taken from 1 uh, uh, Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, where it talks about the giving of offerings. And because it does not have much discussion of tithe in the New Testament, because it's already been covered before, it's, God's now talking about giving of offerings. And the giving of offerings is what that discussion is. Well, people have said, well, he's just talking about giving of offerings, so that's all we have to do now. No, he didn't negate the tithe. He's just telling them about the offerings. In there. That doesn't mean the tithe is eliminated. It just isn't discussed in those verses in Corinthians. Well, is tithing for today? You better believe it is. God says, I, I'm the Lord, I change not. He didn't change. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8, makes it very clear. Here, men that die receive tithes. That's talking about people who are physically here would receive tithes that they're being brought to the church. And there, where's there? That means it's in a different place. He receiveth them of whom it's witness that he liveth. Who is the one in Scripture that's witnessed that he liveth? Jesus, who has been raised from spiritual death to spiritual life, alive forevermore at the right hand of the Father, King of kings, Lord of lords. So what does that tell us? As tithes are brought to us, they're simultaneously received by Jesus in heaven, meaning that tithing's for the New Testament as well. All these people have, are failing, and they're going to be in trouble because if you, don't, if you don't bring the tithe, you're robbing God, and you're not going to be spared, remember. We've talked about this in the tithing messages. You're not going to be spared in the day when the judgment comes. You're going to be burned up, as it talks about in the end of Malachi 3 and also in Malachi 4. For you who haven't seen this, we'll just take a moment to show you this. Remember what God says in Malachi chapter 3 where they were robbing God, you robbed me in tithes and offerings. He said, you're cursed with a curse. Are you going to be blessed or even saved if you're cursed with a curse? No. Are you going to be protected? No, you're going to be burned up and wiped out. And when he comes down here to, at the end here, when he talks about those who feared the Lord, a book of remembrance was written for them that feared the Lord. And those are the ones who are bringing the tithes and offerings to him. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my jewels, which is my peculiar, valued property, peculiar treasure, and I will spare them. He's going to spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him, because we're serving him with the tithes and offerings. Then he'll return to serve between the righteous, who are the righteous? The ones who are bringing their tithes and offerings. And the wicked, who are the wicked? The ones that aren't, that are robbing him that are stealing between him that serve God and the one that serves him not, who's not serving him. If people are not bringing the tithe, they're not serving God. They have refused and they're in disobedience to the service of the Lord. Look at what it says here. Behold, the day cometh that will burn as an oven. That's the judgment time, isn't it? And all the proud and all that do wickedly, referring to those ones who don't tithe, shall be stubble. The day will come that will burn them up saith the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. Destruction is going to come upon them. What a mistake. All because they have been deceived by not believing the truth. Well, so we see what happened there, and now what was God going to do, of course? Well, another one came on the scene. God, of course, they had another child, Adam and Eve, knew his wife again, bare a son, called his name Seth. And this began... After Abel was killed, this began the, the line of the sons of God who would follow God. There were the sons of God, declared in Scripture, and, then the, and the daughters of God, and then there were the sons of men and the daughters of men. Those are the ones who didn't follow God. They were rejecting His ways. 
He said, He appointed to me another seed, and this also began the seed coming towards, towards the Messiah who was going to come, and also the covenants that were all made when they were made to Abraham and Moses and David. Those covenants were made not just to them, but to the seed. And the seed is referring to Christ who comes on the scene, who is going to be that seed who's going to fulfill all those covenants and accomplish the plan of God to bring forth the restoration of all things and beginning by, of course, being the redemptive one, paying the ransom price, giving his life, being made sin, the sacrifice, final sacrifice for all the sins of mankind, paying that price, and then accomplishing the reconciliation, which is getting born from spiritual death to spiritual life. When he got the exchange, he got a brand new spirit for mankind, becoming a firstborn of all creation, because what had to happen? Spiritually, everybody was dead. So there had to be a new creation. Who could bring it forth? Man couldn't do it because he was spiritually dead. Who could do it? It had to be a man. He was involved in the fall, so it had to be a man. Well, who could do it? Only God could do it. So what's the answer? God had to become a man to take that place and become that ransom, the one who was the kinsman redeemer, who was going to accomplish this work for man to bring restoration. That's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God already had it set. If these things would happen, of what would need to be done. And so, that's of course the seed now, and that began the messianic line and the sons of God line. The sons of God line continued on. <clears throat> There's actually the first one that began to proclaim the preaching of the word, of the name, the calling on the name of the Lord. This is a mistake actually here when it says Enos, then man began to call upon the name of the Lord. It's a mistake. It, what Young's has translated correctly from the, from the uh, Hebrew, and a beginning was made of preaching in the name of Jehovah, not calling upon. It's not in there. It's the preaching uh, in the name of Jehovah is the way it should be translated correctly, because Enos is the one who began it. And he was the third. Remember that Adam was first, Seth was second, and then Enos was the third but he was the first who began to preach. And the reason we know that is because it talks about there that Noah was the eighth preacher. We'll look at that later on. He's the eighth preacher, but he was the tenth from Adam. So how could he be the eighth preacher? Because the first preacher was Enos, beginning with the third. And that's why he is called the eighth preacher. So they began to preach in the name of the Lord. And the gospel, uh, people were being preached to at that time. They were hearing the word. God had people preaching from the beginning when they were preaching in the name of the Lord. So they were supposed to, of course, respond to that. And there was a sons of God line that came forth. That sons of law line came, Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalilah, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, all the way up to Noah. That's the line if you follow it. Now we see that there were those who were following God. Genesis chapter 5, verse 18. Here it says, Jared lived 162 years and he begat Enoch. And then it says, after he lived there, he lived 800 years, begot sons and daughters. So all his days were that. And then Enoch came on the scene, lived 65 years, begat Methuselah. Notice what it says about Enoch. He walked with God. He was walking with God, so he was following, obeying his commands and doing what he told him to do. And so he, after he begot Methuselah 300 years, and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. How Everybody else was living almost 900 years or so. Why was it 365 days for him? Because he was taken by God and did not see death. Enoch, which means one who's dedicated, one who's dedicated to follow the way of the Lord, which is what you and I are to be. He walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So he did not have physical death. And this is all pointing towards the dedicated ones. Remember everything that you see in the beginning is going to come to pass in the end. The dedicated ones, the ones who are walking in the way of the Lord continually, 
those are the ones that are going to be raptured because this is all pointing towards the rapture. He got taken, didn't taste death. Also, at the end, those who've come through at the end of the tribulation will be caught up to meet the Lord and they will also not have physical death, will be changed in an instant and get a glorified body. So, as this was proceeding ahead, Genesis chapter 6, We'll just look at a couple things here. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. The sons of God, that's the line following God, remember, saw the daughters of men, that's the line not following the, law, the law, way of God, saw that they were fair, oh, they were good looking, you know, pleasant. And they took them wives of all that they chose. Should the sons of God who are following God, walking in his ways, take the ones who are not following God? No. What happens when you do that? The why, just like what happened with Solomon, he took the ones of the ites, your wives will turn your heart away from God. And that's what was happening. Because they picked them based on what they looked like, beautiful or you know, good looking or whatever, which is a mistake. You always pick a person because of spiritually they're right with God and their spiritual traits and they're someone who's right with God. That's who you pick. Not based on looks. That's a mistake. People that have done things on looks they usually had a lot of problems if they didn't have this character of the Lord and they weren't right with God. What a mistake. They just didn't see that this was a mistake back then. And so the Lord said, because these ones then started to walk contrary to the ways of the Word of God. The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. He says, For that he also is flesh. Now what does he mean by saying he's flesh? He's not spirit in, rely, in relation to God anymore alive. He's just flesh. That's all he's got. And why is he flesh? You don't see it here, but there is another word. This is the word flesh. They didn't translate it in the King James, unfortunately. It means here that another word in the, Greek, or in the Hebrew is to go astray. Young's brings this out. In their erring or going astray, what was the erring? When he disobeyed and he spiritually died. And what's now left? He's just flesh. <laughs> That's it. So he's talking about man being, because of his disobedience and spiritually dead state, because of erring, he's flesh. Now, he's got, here's man not walking right at all. And so he says, I'm not going to strive with man all this, all this long, this time. And then he makes a statement, say, yet his days shall be 120 years. People have thought, well, that must be the span of life for man. That's not the span of life for man. People have assumed it, but they, you can't, can't, you've got to get revelation from God on what? things are. How do we know that that can't be the span of life for man? We're at Genesis 6-3. Well, that means after this time, you know, after the flood, there couldn't be anybody living beyond 120. Well, did some people live only up to that time or less? Well, we see in Genesis chapter 25, verse 7, all the days of Abraham's life were 100, three score and 15. He lived 175 years. Well, that shows that that can't mean 120 years is the end of our lifespan because this guy lived more than it. Was there another case? Yeah. Ishmael, he lived 137 years. And then we look at one other one with Jacob. Chapter 47, verse 9. Jacob, all the days of my pilgrimage are 130 years. So, that destroys the 120 years lifespan thing. It's not talking about that. So, when God said his days are 120, 120 years, what's he talking about? A year in God's standpoint, when you look at what he speaks of, is a jubilee year. Because every 50 years, the ones who had been in bondage or had been sold or uh, lost their possessions, everything was restored. 
And God's years are jubilee years, which are 50 years, every 50th year. 120 times 50 is what? 6,000. So what's he talking about when he says his days shall be 120 years? He's talking about 120 jubilee years. He's talking about his days of ruling the earth because of what well, was given into his hands, but now it's given into Satan's hands because of the original lease given are 6,000 years, 120 times 50. Now, we'll go to cover another thing. <clears throat> there were giants in the earth. Now, what are the giants? And why were they this way? Look at the number 5307. I don't know why it won't come up. This program's been doing funny things. Let's try it again. Huh. Just won't come up for some. There it is. It's the word, comes from the word nafal, which means fall. This is why Young's has translated correctly fallen ones. Well, what are fallen ones that are walking in sin continually? The giants were the fallen ones of men who were walking in sin continually in the earth in those days. So the giants were already here, which is all the fallen ones. Also after that, when the sons of God, what did they do? They took the daughters of men, remember, came in unto the daughters of men who are not following God, which is a mistake. And of course, they're not going to have, they're going to be producing children that are going to, and their hearts are going to turn them away. It's not going to be good. They bear children to them. The same became mighty men, strong and mighty, which were of old men. This is the word mortal men of renown. The false teaching and lying teaching has been that the sons of God are angels that came into the daughters of men and the angels had intercourse with the daughters of men and produced these hybrid uh, results. It's all lies. It's false. Anybody that believes that these are all angels is totally deceived. First of all, the word sons is the word bane, which means sons. The word God is the word Elohim. <clears throat> Not talking about angels. Is the word angels in the word of God? <clears throat> sure it is. Here's where we see the first use of it. Genesis 16, 7. We put the cursor over the word angel. What is this? It's the word malach. That's, if he, if, and does God say what he means and mean what he says? Would he say one thing? No, it's not meaning that. It's not meaning something else. Who are you to say that the Bain, Elohim, sons of God, it doesn't really mean that. <laughs> These people need to be fired and eliminated from teaching anything. It's all lies. We see this has happened. People are believing that this is because, of course, they have observed what has been said in the lying false book of Enoch, which is not a part of Scripture, that these were fallen angels mating with the women and producing these hybrid ones, these giants, supposedly. But that's not right because, number one, the giants were already here. <laughs> well, if the giants were already here, then this can't be meaning about producing giants, these ones. See, it's all lies. People twist scriptures and to try to deceive you. All lies. So, these ones, and you have to watch other translations. It's the Septuagint, which is a faulty translation. It was the Greek translation of the Hebrew of the Old Testament in Greek. <clears throat> and it translates the, the saying that it's the angels, you know. These ones are from the, thinking that these, these giants were, uh, and these all were the angels. They chant, translated that in various places as the and, and like in Job, the Bain Elohim is the angels. It's not. It's not talking about them whatsoever. They're deceived. So what this is talking about, the sons of God, who should, following God, came into the daughters of men, bore these ones that were mortal men. Otherwise, it was men. It wasn't anything of angels. 
producing these so-called giants. They were already here. The giants were produced because of the fallen ones who committed a whole lot of sin. <laughs> That's what they were. <clears throat> God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination, the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I mean, the evil got a whole, I mean, these guys all rejected the way of the Lord. And these sons of God that were following him, now they come along with the daughters of men and they're gonna turn their heart away from the way of the Lord. So the whole group is all evil now. <clears throat> the thoughts, the wickedness of man was great. And God had repented the Lord that he made man on the earth. That also shows you the fact that, did God know that all these things were going to happen? No. He knew it could happen. He gave man had a will, but if he's repenting that he made him on the earth, I wish I'd have never done this, and he already knew it was going to happen, why would he do it to begin with? His purpose was, of course, to have a family. And he set everything in the beginning that was supposed to happen. At the same time, understanding everything that could happen one way or the other, whether they obeyed or disobeyed, he said everything, all, all set. From the very foundation of the world, everything was set. So, he grieved him in his heart. <clears throat> so what's he gonna do? I'm gonna destroy him. I'll destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repents me that I've made them. He's sorry that he made them. But, one man, hadn't fallen for this evil. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why was that? Because Noah was a just man, he was a righteous one, meaning he was obeying God's word. And he was perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. That's exactly what we see the statement was about Enoch. He was righteous, he's perfect in his generations, <clears throat> and he's walking with God. Well, that meant this guy was still a son of God. He wasn't contaminated like all the rest of them were. So here we got one man, and the earth was corrupt, was filled with violence. It got so bad. It's happening again. The earth is corrupt, and the violence is increasing, and you're going to see it continue to increase as we're going down these last days. Violent ones are getting worse and worse. You read things all the time, people, all the evil things that are happening all over the place and nation after nation and all over, even in this country. God looked on the earth, said it was corrupt, all flesh had corrupted his way, flesh had corrupted his way on the earth. And he says to Noah, the end of all flesh has come. The earth's filled with violence through him and I'm going to destroy them with the earth. <clears throat> but then he tells him to do something because he's going to be preserved. And he tells him, of course, to, tells him to make the ark and gives them all the instructions about making the ark. And of course, that then he's going to uh, bring the flood, yet Noah is going to be saved. Well, we're gonna stop at this point. We've covered a lot at this point in time. What we see is that God had the desire to have a family. God set everything perfect. The angel, top-ranking angel, got jealous. <laughs> Pride, rebelled. One-third of the angels followed him, thought they could overtake God, <laughs> and they're all done. It's all over for them. And then the man who was commanded what to do didn't do it. He knew what he was doing. He listened to the voice of someone else instead of what God had told him to do. Anytime you listen to somebody that's telling you something contrary to God, you're going to be led astray and you're going to be sinning and going in the wrong direction. And so, of course, that cost the whole human race. And yet there was a Sons of God line that was following him, but they all went down the tubes, <laughs> you know, of sin and evil and violence and, wit and you know, total wickedness. But then there's one, and that was the one who was what came through Noah and his family were preserved, and we'll be talking about that and going on from there. And then we'll begin to see the covenants that God began to make <clears throat> with man, which are all pointing towards what Jesus would accomplish as he was going to fulfill it. This is all part of what needed to be done to bring man to the place of being able to be redeemed 
by what Jesus would accomplish and the reconciliation, getting a brand new spirit, coming back into relationship with him and bringing forth the church age into being and all these things came forth to leading up, of course, towards what we are where we're at today, where we're near the end of the church age, when the judgment will come on the church first, and then we will see the judgment come on the world. And yet, those who are the saints, the holy ones, the righteous ones, just like he was, he was going to be protected when the judgment of the flood came. He was. Well, when the judgment's coming on all the world, all the ones who pass the test of the church judgment, the saints, the holy ones, the righteous ones, the ones that conquered and walked in the way of the Lord, they're going to be protected. And as they walk in the way of the Lord, we're going to preach the gospel. The gospel is going to be preached. The Jews are going to be saved during that last three and a half years. They're going to get their chance and they're going to respond this time. And so they'll all come down to the end when the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets will occur and Jesus will catch us up to meet the Lord in the air and just like Enoch didn't suffer death, we won't suffer physical death. And also we will be preserved, just like Noah was preserved when the judgment was poured out. We will be preserved when God's pouring out all the judgments that are going to be happening during the tribulation period. It's only the righteous, the holy ones, that are going to come through, that are going to be protected. There'll be multitudes that'll be one to the Lord during that time, as we know. The Jews will be one and they'll be out preaching the gospel. At the same time, the ones that reject him are going to be taking, they're going to be receiving the Antichrist and taking the mark and they're going to be doomed. And these are all the things that are ahead. It's all laid out in the Word of God. God's plan, purpose, His callings upon us. We obey it and we'll see God accomplish everything in our life. Tremendous things that we see. And of course we see God wants things in our lives to be right, so we come through victorious. Noah was the only one. Well, there's only going to be a few compared to the multitudes that are going to pass the test. We're talking about if the church, before the church age judgment. But then after that, remember, many there's going to be multitudes of people that are going to be one to the Lord or preaching the gospel when the tremendous time is going on in the earth, the judgments happening during the tribulation period. So it's going to be an exciting time. The glory of God will come on the glorious, perfected church that's holy and seen being used mightily in these last days. With difficulty and not easily, we are being saved. Nonetheless, you're going to walk in His ways and God will protect you and you will come through victorious to the end. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of the things that God has done. And we see <clears throat> that He's a performer of His Word and that He will have a righteous, holy people. I thank you for the revelation that is given in the Word of God. We know that Satan's time of ruling in the earth is about up and Jesus is going to take back the rulership over the earth. This has been a hidden mystery, but it's revealed by the Holy Spirit. And as we have this revelation and we see the truth and we walk in line with it, and we are going to be true sons of God, following the Word of God, obedient in all things, going on to perfection, to have the glory of God on us for these end times. Thank you, Father for the work being accomplished in us, and thank you for the truth coming forth as we're going through the plan of redemption, God's great plan. Thank you for bringing forth revelation of truth and us being established in it and not deceived by any of the false teaching that has gone forth in the body of Christ. Thank you, Father, for establishing us in the truth so we can share it with others, so they can come to the place of receiving Jesus and walking in His ways so that they will be like Noah and like the end time glorified, perfected church that will come through to the rapture. Thank you, Father. We'll be doers of your word and see your work accomplished in us. In Jesus' name.
Amen. He's doing it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for all that's been brought forth. Thank you for the understanding coming to everyone. Thank you. As we continue, we'll understand all that God has accomplished and what he has purposed and what he will, of course, do for us as we go down these last days. Thank you for this revelation. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll continue on Wednesday night.